If a modern game doesn't work properly on launch, you can't just take out the cartridge and blow on it like you did back then. But you can still try the old turning it off and on trick. Wake up, Link. Nintendo has gone through some drastic changes over the past 40 or so years. Games came in all shapes and sizes from the retro NES game cartridge to today's Switch cards. Today, let's take a walk through gaming history and look at the evolution of Nintendo's game cartridges. While Nintendo was not the first video game company to come out with cartridges, the Nintendo Entertainment System was the company's first step into the home video game market. The NES began after Nintendo's initial success at video game arcade cabinets back in the early 80s. They began with the Family Computer, or Famicom, which was a Japan-exclusive console that would later become the NES. The systems that came before the Famicom were the consoles like ColecoVision and the Atari, which also had cartridges. Nintendo wanted the game cartridges to be about the size of a cassette tape, but in the end, they were twice as big. When Nintendo aimed for the North American market, they made a few drastic changes to the console's appearance, and also its games. The NES game cartridge was considerably larger than the Famicom game cartridges. However, Nintendo did implement some cost-cutting measures. Some of the earliest NES cartridges were just adapters that housed Famicom games. While it may have differed from its Japanese counterpart in a lot of ways, the classic NES console and cartridge would pave the way for Nintendo in the future. Even today, a lot of fans see the NES as their first real game console, with that memorable cartridge loading sound. Just like that. A few years after the NES's success, Nintendo was looking to break into a new market. What if people could enjoy our games on the go? What if we could store 8-bit games in people's pocket and have them play anywhere? Mind blown. Thus, in 1989, the first Game Boy was released. Before Game Boy, players had Game & Watch games, which were simple low-tech handhelds that had a number of preloaded games. With Game Boy, players could choose from a wide selection of games because of the Game Boy cartridges. They were small enough to be portable while still capable of playing 8-bit games. This was due to the system's lack of color, but what it lacked in aesthetics it made up for with a selection of games and long battery life. While the Game Boy itself would go through several changes in its life, the cartridges would not see a substantial change. They eventually did, but we will get to Nintendo's other handheld systems later on in the video. Nintendo really pushed the envelope in the world of handheld gaming by giving players everything they could want. An affordable, portable device with a good selection of games. It may not have been the only handheld on the market, but the Game Boy had lasting appeal, which would inspire later systems. New system means more power, more bits, and a different cartridge. When the Nintendo Entertainment System was phased out, it was replaced with its next evolution, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Hey, this was before Nintendo got really creative with its game console names. In any case, the SNES was a 16-bit console that was released in North America in 1991, a year before the Super Famicom, the Japan-only variant of the SNES, was released. This would be a very significant generation for video games. Not only did the SNES have some of the most notable titles in Nintendo's history, but the early 90s would be the start of what we know now as the console wars. At the time, Sega launched the Genesis as a direct competitor to Nintendo. This is where we would get the blue blur himself, Sonic the Hedgehog, go up against Mario. Back to the cartridges themselves, they would undergo a smaller design compared to the NES, and would employ a few physical region lock features. North American SNES cartridges would have a rectangular bottom with grooves that match the inside of the console. Other region cartridges just had a smooth ridge without these grooves. The 64-bit era, a lot of players started with an N64. This system had a round of firsts for Nintendo. For starters, there were no region-specific variants of the N64. At least there weren't any that were so drastic. There was no Famicom 64, for example. The cartridges underwent another dramatic transformation. They were slightly smaller than the SNES cartridges and had smoother, rounded edges. A striking change they made was eliminating the label on top of the cartridges. With the NES and SNES cartridges, the game's label was on the face and on the top of the cartridge. This made it easier to stack and organize them. With the N64, they eliminated the top label altogether, and the label and art was just relegated to the face of the cartridge. There were still region-locked protocols for the N64, however. When Nintendo started development on the system, they announced that a chip in the cartridge would prevent games from one region playing on a different region's console. However, they never developed that chip. It was perhaps a cost-saving measure, but Nintendo ended up just using different grooves on the cartridge for different regions of console just like they did with the SNES. 
Everything's better with a little color. The original Game Boy was a game changer when it came to handheld games, but more needed to be done. So Nintendo upped the graphical capabilities and color to their Game Boy, and in 1998, the Game Boy Color was released. While there were improvements to the GBC's memory and processing power, there were some modifications to the cartridges. The GBC would play original Game Boy cartridges, but GBC exclusive cartridges were just built differently. Specifically, they lacked the locking notch Game Boy cartridges had that would lock the cartridge in place while the system was turned on. What is perhaps the most unusual variation on the GBC cartridges was the rumble pack. This wasn't standard, but some games would have extra space for a motor in the cartridge itself. This motor would cause the whole device to vibrate, adding depth to the game. This was similar to the N64's rumble pack, though that peripheral would go onto the controller itself rather than the cartridge itself. This would give the player added feedback. Other systems would include a rumble pack of some kind before vibration feedback would become a standard feature. The Game Boy Color's life would be well spent, but short-lived as the trend during the early 2000s would be to make things smaller and smaller. In 2001, the Game Boy Advance was released to usher in the 32-bit era in handheld gaming. Graphically, the GBA is similar to the SNES, but what made the GBA stand out compared to the GBC was that the cartridges were smaller. In addition to the smaller size, the GBA did have a number of cartridge-related peripherals. One of the odder ones was a cleaner cartridge. This was a white cartridge that had a soft cloth that would clean the connectors of the system. While the Game Boy Advance did have a pretty long shelf life, there were variations that took its place with one huge quality of life change, a backlight. The Game Boy Advance SP soon replaced the GBA with its more compact size and backlit screen. The GBA was able to play GB and GBC cartridges, but the GBA cartridges were uniquely small and could be only played on the GBA and future variants like the Game Boy SP and Game Boy Micro. The Nintendo DS would also be able to play Game Boy Advance games, but this would be the last system that would use cartridges as we understand them. From here on out, we'll be going in a new direction altogether. In the same year the GBA dropped, Nintendo released what many believe to be the greatest console Nintendo ever made, the Nintendo GameCube. Yes, yes, cue the GameCube intro memes, all of them are welcome here. With the GameCube, we see a lot of firsts for Nintendo consoles. The most notable change for this list is the transition away from cartridges, and instead we see the first official console to read micro DVD discs. Technically, the N64 was going to have a CD reader, but it was never released outside of Japan and was a short-lived peripheral for the N64. The system read optical discs that were noticeably smaller than normal DVDs. Unlike the GameCube's competitors at the time, the GameCube could not play normal CDs or DVDs. Additionally, now that the console ran discs that were much smaller, save files had to be stored on external memory cards that could be inserted directly into the system. The GameCube had a lot to offer and even took some risks when it came to games and hardware. Some of those risks may not have stuck, but the GameCube holds a special place in the hearts of a lot of Nintendo fans. When you're trying to innovate, sometimes more is in fact better. In 2004, nobody could have seen the DS coming and being such a massive hit. This additional screen and the upgraded graphical capabilities was just what players wanted at the time. The Nintendo DS offered a unique experience with the addition of a touchscreen, but it was still able to play GBA games just fine. Of course, the DS didn't have cartridges, at least not in the way we've talked about them up to this point. Nintendo DS cartridges were smaller still, smaller than the GBA cartridges, and resembled SD cards. The DS would see a few drastic changes during its lifetime, including the DS Lite, the DSi, and the DSi X. XL. They all worked relatively the same way until we got to the 3DS, which broke new grounds with its glasses-free 3D. The cartridges also changed with the 3DS by including a notch that would fit in a 3DS, but not in a normal DS. Additionally, the 3DS did away with the GBA port altogether, which means the DS was the last handheld console capable of playing any kind of Game Boy games. After the GameCube had its run, people were wondering what odd direction Nintendo would go with next. The Wii was at one point shocking, but altogether familiar. With this new console came a new way to store games. In an ironic twist, given the Wii's unorthodox appearance and innovations, the system ran on normal-sized optical discs. We say optical discs because despite being the size of a normal DVD, the Wii could not play regular CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, or HD DVDs. However, it was able to read GameCube discs as well as have controller ports for GameCube controllers 
controllers and memory cards. While we would later get the Wii U, nothing would change substantial to the system or to discs or games. This leads us to today with the Nintendo Switch. Released in 2017, the Switch marries the idea of console gaming and handheld gaming with the tablet and docking port. The Switch games are stored on microcards similar to the ones used on a DS, though surprisingly even smaller. With cartridges getting smaller and smaller, the obvious question was asked. What if someone swallowed or ate a Nintendo Switch cartridge? Well, Nintendo thought of that, in a way. It was rumored that Nintendo cartridges were made to be extremely bitter and awful to taste to discourage ingestion. Nintendo confirmed this in a statement that warned parents and buyers to keep cartridges out of the reach of small children, and that a bittering agent is mixed into the plastic to discourage eating. It is non-toxic, of course, but the bittering agent is denatonium benzoate, the same agent they use to discourage nail biting. It just goes to show, no matter how far we advance as a society, people will still try to lick or eat the small plastic bits that come with your new toy. And that is a look at the major Nintendo cartridges over the years. Before we end the video, we'd like to hit you with a quick did you know? Back when Nintendo was making the Famicom, they originally designed it to be an all-in-one family computer with a keyboard and floppy disk reader. I wonder how Nintendo would have evolved if they'd stuck with that design.